tassa bhagavato arahato samha sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samha sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samha sambuddhasa purang damang sangang namasami A little feedback. So these last few weeks, we've been talking about the khandas, which is the Buddhist Pali terminology for the aggregates. And this term refers specifically to the focuses or the focus of our identity and what the self tends to take as its uh, identity and basis. So the five aggregates are referred to as the first is form or the body, the second is feeling, Vedana, the third is perception, the fourth is mental formations or volitional formations, sankhara. And the fifth is consciousness or vijnana. And the word aggregate or khanda in Pali can refer to a mass um, or a heap. And it can either be a heap of something heavy that we carry but it can also refer to a heap of flame. And in this image, I think hides the essence of the movement that characterizes the Buddhist path, which is one of heaviness to lightness and one of the agitated nature of flame to the cool, radiant energy of light. So this movement is almost nowhere better characterized than in uh, the second, or sorry, the third of the Buddha's discourses called the Adita Pariyaya Sutta, or the Fire Sermon. And at the time of the Buddha, the fire worshippers were a strong um, and popular form of uh, ascetic, asceticism. And they tended to be bound to a specific location. In this case, the cult of fire worshippers lived in a river valley and cultivated sacred fires there. And the energy of spiritual heat or tapas was what they cultivated. So this discourse is one of the most impressive examples of the Buddha's skill in teaching in that he reverses everything for these practitioners and in doing so uproots their former ideas and the discourse, it is said, issued into the enlightenment of over a thousand practitioners. So what he does is the Buddha takes them to a hill, uh, Gaya Sise, and moves them from their traditional geographical haunt. And then he uses the environment around him, pointing to the wildfires in the distance. And then finally, and most significantly, he reverses the tenor or the valence of the concept of heat and fire. So where the fire worshippers were trying to cultivate this energy of spiritual heat or tapas, the Buddha says, instead, that this energy of burning is an agitated 
bound energy that should be abandoned. And he says, the eye is burning, forms are burning, eye consciousness is burning. Burning with what? With the fires of greed, hatred, and delusion. And he goes through that with each of the sense bases. And this uh, shift in what was considered good is situated in a philosophy that saw fire as a bound and imprisoned form of the fire god Agi, which was thought to pervade all things equally. And when fire took root or began to cling to a fuel in the nature of flame, then it was bound and suddenly imprisoned in a relationship of feeding upon that fuel. So when a fire went out in the Buddha's time, Nibbana, it was not conception, the idea was not a cold darkness that replaced it, but rather the pervasive and pervading energy of light through all things. So the Buddha was saying that one should strive to give up this agitated and bound nature and energy of fire, this energy of feeding on the world, and replace it with one of the cool and radiant energy of light. And I've referenced before how when translating Budo, Bhikkhu Bodhi uh, chose to use the translation of the enlightened one as opposed to the awakened one because in the suttas again and again the enlightened mind is compared and uh, compared to that of light. So when the Buddha points to the aggregates, these five heaps of flame or of identity, what he's directing us to do is to move back a little bit from our clinging to them and to utilize each as part of the path. So specifically, he speaks about how uh, Ajahn Jeff uses the analogy of one taking five loads of bricks, which one has been carrying around, these aggregates, and laying them on the ground as the road to the unconditioned or awakening. And similarly, one is moving from a relationship in the world where one is feeding and clinging to instead one where one is moving into the world constantly with a sense of, may this be well. Uh, it's like Ajahn Suchito says, when the heart moves into the world, so often it moves in with a sense of feeding and wanting and clinging. But part of our stepping back from these khandas and realizing that we can't control them and that they aren't worthy of attaching to as me and mine is that when we step back from that, we're able to shift our relationship with the world to one of blessing, where we're moving into the landscape of our lives with the constant sense of giving. And this fundamental shift in our orientation towards the worlds and our experience is in some ways the most significant shift in a life. Instead of reaching into, as Ajahn Sona says, reaching into the world, which is a liquid, expecting to find a solid, um, constantly looking for some sort of refuge in these khandas, in the body, which is constantly decaying, in our feelings, which are constantly shifting between pleasant and unpleasant, and having and forcing us to run to and from them, um, and from all the other khandas, from trying to find solidity there. Instead, we are moving towards a relationship where we acknowledge 
the fragile and changing nature of each of those and instead decide to use them as tools and tools towards our own awakening and those of those around us as well. In the words of Ajahn Chah, we still pick things up, but we hold them lightly and we put them down when we no longer need them. So we moved through in the previous weeks the first four of these khandas. And the metaphors the Buddha gives for the different aggregates are uh, varied. Form he compares to a lump of foam. Um, so the body is actually composed of many elements, just like a lump of foam is composed of countless bubbles. And it's fading and delicate and fragile. Feeling he compares to the ripples spreading out from a raindrop. And so you can think of this, the raindrop as a point of contact and how the ripples of pleasant or unpleasant spread from that. Perception he compares to a mirage. And we can think about how we see and place so much uh, baggage and extraneous perceptions on top of individual perceptions that come into our lives, just as a mirage of, say, water uh, manifests on the simple asphalt in front of us on a drive. And how much of our lives is taken up by trying to cling to and chase after this mirage of water. And the fourth he compares to a plantain tree, volitional formations as a, uh, if, if you haven't seen a plantain tree, it's a bit like an onion. It wraps around itself until there's no heartwood. So sankaras, these volitional formations, they have no core. And the fifth of consciousness he compares to a magician at a crossroads. And the image of a magician at a crossroads is interesting because consciousness is where each of these khandas intersects. It receives and holds all of them within its uh, purview. Just as at a crossroads one sees every traveler that comes by. It's in some ways the most difficult of the khandas to talk about though, of the aggregates, because where each of the other aggregates or khandas is active and involves, it's easy to see. There's a lot of motion associated with it. So with the form, you can point to the body. Um, with feeling, you can see clearly the uh, attraction or aversion towards things in our lives. With perception, you can see how, depending on your mood, the person who walks into the room is your enemy or your friend or annoying or loved. With mental formations, these programs or personality uh, formations, we maneuver our lives by it's easy to see how we develop these habits, these constructs in our lives, how we conceptualize ourselves as extroverted or introverted and move uh, through experience based on these programs. But what do you point to with consciousness? Because in some ways consciousness is the light that illuminates all of these. It's closer to the subject and farther away from the object. Bhante Analio has an interesting way of looking at the khandas. He says that form tells you where you are, feeling tells you how you are, perception tells you uh, how you experience, mental formations tells you why you act, and percep uh, consciousness, vijnana, tells you whereby you experience. So. 
the very fact that it's the means by which we experience means it's even harder to point out and to see. In the suttas, it's designated as the knowing quality. So, or rather, the Buddha says that one is conscious of flavors. It's his most simple example. One knows sweet as sweet, bitter as bitter, sour as sour. And Ajahn Tiradamo recommends trying to isolate the con element of consciousness by changing your awareness through the set spaces. So looking at your hearing and then your touch and then your visual field and trying to see if you can parse out the common element in each of those that they all share. And that's the element of the knowing, of vijnana, consciousness. What's difficult is consciousness Ajahn Chah would frequently compare it to a bottle of water mixed with something else like oil. And as long as it's being shaken, the oil and water remain mixed. Just as, as long as our experience is agitated and filled with sense impressions and movement and interaction, it's as if the bottle's always being shaken. And consciousness and its objects uh, remain, they're hard to parse out which is which. All we know is we see the person we're attracted to and a whole trajectory, a whole cascade of feelings and reactions follow. When we become still though, when we meditate, when we bring the mind to one object, then it's as if we've stopped shaking the bottle and the oil and the water separate and the consciousness and the objects of consciousness separate. So this is why we stabilize the mind is when you bring the mind to one point again and again or to one object, it becomes still. And soon you begin to see and you'll notice this after you exit a meditation an emotion can come up, but you're not as bound to that emotion. There's a sense of separation, of the ability to be mindful and to respond rather than react. Because there's a sense of your consciousness being different and separate from that object and not completely dependent on it. So an analogy uh, is given of flame. And if you have a candle in a environment where wind is buffeting it this way and that, it's always sputtering and flickering. But if you move it into a still room, then it grows bright and steady. And that's how it is with meditation and consciousness is as the mind stills, you begin to notice a radiance that pervades all things which is how consciousness imbues experience. And you can see this very clearly in the Mindfulness of Breathing Sutta, is that this sutta, which is composed of 16 steps through the different ways of relating to the breath, after moving through an experience in the sixth and seventh steps of becoming sensitive to refreshment, uh, rapture, as it's sometimes translated, and then sensitive to uh, pleasure, sukha. One becomes sensitive to the mental, what are called mental formations, and then calms those mental formations. At which point, the next step involves becoming sensitive to the mind itself, which although it's not an exact correspondence to consciousness, I think is very similar. So what you can look at this at, as is, when you become sensitive to rapture and then to pleasure, 
it's as if you're brightening the mind. And this is actually frequently in meditation where an uh, image of light will manifest or where the nada sound, a subtle hissing or ringing below the auditory landscape will come into being and become very discernible. And as that background radiance of consciousness itself grows, then the coarse forms of thoughts and feelings and perception, and every one of those other four khandas, of those four aggregates, which are more coarse, become especially visible on that bright and clean and increasingly radiant backdrop. So it's as if you have a piece of parchment, and the parchment is being backlit more and more, and the writing on the front of the parchment becomes more and more coarse and distinct. And then in the Anapanasati Sutta, the Mindfulness of Breathing Sutta, it says one becomes sensitive to those mental formations, which is like the writing on that parchment. It's the thoughts, the images, the perceptions. And then one calms them, which is like letting all that writing fade and drop until you're left just with the parchment, bright, clean, radiant. And that is the mind or consciousness to some extent, uh, more secluded, more isolated, more clear than sometimes we've ever experienced it before. Of course, it's not pure consciousness. Um, it's just dependent on more and more subtle objects. But you can discern it more and more clearly as well. And I think an analogy one could use for this is one found in the suttas, where the Buddha compares consciousness to light, uh, unbounded consciousness to light. And he says, Bhikkhus, imagine there's a house with windows and light streams in through the window on the east. Where does it land? And the monks say it lands on the western wall. And he says, what if there's no western wall? They say it lands on the ground. If there's no ground, then it lands in the water. And if it does not land in the water, then they say it, it does not land. And similarly, the Buddha says, consciousness unbound without surface. And there's some debate about whether this refers to nibbana or the, uh, a refined state of meditation called the plane of infinite consciousness. But regardless, this idea of light that lands nowhere, I think is a, a beautiful image for what manifests more and more. And it speaks to this idea that as the mind, that flame of the mind becomes still and focused in meditation and grows strong, it's almost as if you stop identifying with the flame and more and more you're just present with the light that the flame gives off. You let go of that agitated, imprisoned nature of consciousness and let go into a wider and cooler radiance. Consciousness changes as we practice as well. There's an analogy in the suttas or in the commentaries where uh, perception is compared to the faculty which knows the basic qualities of something. Uh, say a man looking at a coin uh, or a child looking at a coin is like perception. They see that it's metal. They see that there's shapes. Consciousness discerns more. Consciousness sees that it's a coin. It knows that it's used for uh, monetary exchange. But wisdom is what knows what currency the coin is, uh, if it's fake or real. Um, so similarly, consciousness Wisdom knows the impermanent and transitory nature of sense experience and 
can help steer consciousness towards liberation. And consciousness in the commentaries, it said, it's difficult to separate consciousness and wisdom. Sometimes they seem like one and the same. So we can expect that more and more, when we become conscious of something, as we've practiced, that act of being conscious of something is informed by wisdom. The light of our awareness landing on something becomes brighter and more discerning. It's entwined with it. The power of looking to this, even though it's hard to kind of pinpoint consciousness unless you've really moved into calm states of meditation, is that although it's the most subtle quality pervading all of our experience, it's also the most pervasive quality pervading all of our experience because it pervades all of our experience. So that means that it influences everything. So one way of looking at it a bit is uh, in terms of mindfulness of mind um, in the Anapanasati Sutta, this parchment that's bright and backlit and radiant and clean. You also could look at it as the backdrop of a movie screen. And as the images fade from the screen, you're left just with that canvas hung down upon which the images were projected. And whereas beforehand, you're running across that screen trying to touch and move and interact with all of those shifting images, suddenly you're left just with that backdrop. And you have a chance then to smooth out the wrinkles in the backdrop, to clean the stains in the backdrop in a way that you wouldn't be able to do if there was this image, these coarse colors projected on it. But when you've done that, when you've descended to these deeper states of meditation, say in mindfulness of breathing, the next step after becoming sensitive to the mind is you gladden the mind and you concentrate the mind. And when you're in these subtle states, then even a small thought of metta, of loving kindness, spreads like a bead of gold dye would spread out on this canvas if dropped. You alter the whole flavor and tenor of the background awareness. And then when the mind begins to move again and that movie reel begins to play, then every image projected onto the screen is flavored by the new, brightened, enlivened and loving consciousness. Because as long as there's these deep wrinkles and stains and sticky popcorn stuck to the screen, then everything projected on it is warped and twisted. And only when we've had a chance to stop the reel for a time and smooth out that screen do we have a chance to alter everything in our lives by shifting the background pervasive perception. It's as if that magician at the crossroads was formerly selling snake oil to every person that passed, every mind moment. And suddenly we've replaced him with a kind and caring, I don't know, magician, <laughs> and who's intent just on more and more um, helping those who come. And until we've achieved awakening, you can't get away from a magician completely. There's always one at the crossroads, but can you turn him into a benevolent one who tricks us a little bit less? So one interesting way of looking at this, it's difficult because when talking about awareness and consciousness, you are talking about something so fundamental that what do you point to exactly unless you speak about these refined states of meditation? But I think one way I, th I thought that it could be useful to look at is to see what world you're living in. In Buddhist cosmology, uh, you know, Buddhism is frequently presented as an extremely sort of secular system of psychology. And yet, 
looking in the suttas, you find that, you know, however sort of wild the, or colorful the Christian cosmology is, uh, we Buddhists have a far, a pretty robust cosmology ourselves. I think the Christian cosmology has one level of heaven. We have a, at least got upwards of 15 or 16 and 32 realms of existence in total. So these are thought of as the stations um, or the realms at which consciousness uh, manifests. And if it's difficult to point to the exact flavor of consciousness as the backdrop, we can infer its nature by what realm it chooses to live in. So looking at this Buddhist cosmology as an analogy for our lives and as a indicator of our state of consciousness can be helpful as a metaphor. So this can be something very simple. The Brahma realms in uh, Buddhist cosmology are thought of as the realms of the formless uh, of the Brahma gods. And these are states analogous to the jhanas, to these deep states of unified awareness. And looking at these states, they're thought of as unbelievably broad and loving. They're associated with the, what are called the Brahma Viharas, the uh, boundless abodes of loving kindness, of compassion, of rejoicing, of equanimity. And the Brahma realms aren't, the, the states of the jhana, whether or not they are based on loving kindness practice, are analogous to the Brahma realms. Um, but what's significant is that these realms are broad. They encompass the entire cosmos. So one can infer from this that a state of concentration when the mind is unified is not a single narrowed, constricted point. Rather, it is a broad and unified awareness, like the realm of the Brahmas. And similarly, the other realms, there's the realms of the devas who uh, cavort in various groves and indulge in sensual pleasures. Um, I think middle-class America has a nice flavor of that, Orange County and such. Uh, you have the human realm, which is rife with suffering and with the potential for awakening. You have the realm of hungry ghosts, uh, these beings with tiny necks that are pictured with tiny necks and enormous bellies, always starving and hungry and cold. You have the realm of the Asuras, uh, what are known in Greek mythology as the Titans, uh, which are constantly battling and um, enraged. And they think they're in heaven, except once every few millennia, they see the coral tree, a tree in the realm of the heaven of the devas blossom, and they realize that they are, in fact, not in heaven. And then they try to attack the heaven realms, apparently. And this can be seen as an analogy for how we think sometimes we can move through anger towards refining and perfecting our life, but it never works. We can never, the Titans never win. And then you have the hell realms, which um, Ajahn Sona suggested that Dante actually just got his hand on a Buddhist cosmology manual, um, which is actually, there's a good deal of evidence for it. It corresponds almost perfectly to the Buddhist conception of hell. And if you want to see very clearly what these states that taunt and enslave us look like, then look through those realms of hell, the freezing realms, the realms of fire, of burning, uh, the realms of wandering in darkness. So what realm do you live in? And it probably changes from the morning before coffee to the morning after coffee <laughs> to the morning an hour after coffee. And 
yet you can see that realm slowly shift. You can see how in those who do not have a spiritual practice or a refuge, how the weight of the world and the condas steadily weighs them down. And maybe they're in a freezing hell realm of loneliness, or maybe they're the person who always is talking about what's wrong and hashing over that one argument or that one political party. And don't be mistaken, that's, that's a hell realm. And as Buddhists, we never, ever get to believe in righteous anger. We have no excuse for it. Love and action done through love is always more powerful. So we never get to justify it descending to the hell realm or to the realm of the asuras, thinking it's heaven or that it's worth something because it's not. It's below us. Or do we find that over time practicing, we somehow move out of those lower realms of constriction and weight and darkness into a field of blessings? And this is my experience. Ajahn Sona has said that you can expect within five years of practice to be 50% happier. And I think that's an accurate representation. And I remember after being a monk for some time, um, there was a point where the words lamentation and despair, which are sort of the two descriptors attached to the end of suffering in or sorry, the uh, end of the 12 links of dependent origination, sorrow, pain, lamentation, grief, and despair. And I believe there's some gnashing of teeth involved, which is interesting in that it's both in Christianity and in Buddhist cosmology. But when lamentation didn't quite apply anymore, because you no longer believe the khandas are you. Because as long as they are, then your body is never good enough. It never matches up. And your personality is always flawed and broken because it is. And only when you've stopped clinging to them so much does the world become a bright place. And every heavy form and heap that you've grabbed onto becomes a veil for something brighter beyond. And more and more that consciousness which pervaded all things and touches everything in our experience because it's how we perceive, begins to imbue them with light. And our palms open and drop this collection of five stones. And we find that what we're holding in our empty palm is light and sunlight and that that's enough. And maybe that was the secret of the Desert Fathers in moving into the desert in that where everyone else just saw emptiness, they saw the gold of sunlight and that that was true gold. And it's like Meister Eckhart said that empty of things, full of God, full of God, or full of things, empty of God. And we obviously don't use the term God in Buddhism to represent the highest aspiration, but it nonetheless points to this increasing sense of the brightness which pervades our lives and how we find little by little ourselves moving into greater and greater vistas of blessing. And we find that we're able more and more to relinquish our grip and feeding and agitated nature of relationship towards these five focuses or stations of awareness and release into something else. And that, what that is, is uh, beyond any of the khandas. So, I wish you all the best luck, and um, yeah, it's been a pleasure.
So many mics. <laughs> um. Okay, so we have some time for Q and A and discussion um, before we have our usual coffee social and other exciting things. Um, does anyone have anything they'd like to speak about? Or ask a questions, Roya. Um, uh, I guess I have a two-part question. So the first part is: Would you say consciousness and the ego are the one and the same? And then the second part: I don't know if this is like I'm getting confused because uh, I was trained in the yogic lineage. Mm. Mm. And that never made sense to me because we were incarnated in this human life, right? For mm -hmm. a reason. And you kind of can't get through it without the ego mm -hmm. to some extent. Like, you have to do worldly things in order to survive. So, is that a Buddhist concept as well? And I really like the analogy of. Rather than letting go of the condos altogether, rather you use them as a bricks upon the path. So cons consciousness is kind of a tool to get us to enlightenment instead of just like a belief, right? Mm. That was a great question. So the question for the live stream or anyone who couldn't hear is, uh, first, is consciousness somewhat equivalent to the ego? And um, the questioner had heard the idea frequently that the idea is to let go of the ego, which is confusing because we, having been incarnated in this life, need the ego to move through the world skillfully. So what is the Buddhist take on that? And uh, she also appreciated the analogy of those five loads of bricks being used as the path that made a bit more sense. Is that about right? Okay. I'd say the ego, in a Western psychological sense, would correspond more closely to the fourth khanda of Sankara, which is translated in, like I said last time, it's like the, the, the key element in Sankara is intention, and it, it gathers up all the other khandas in service of it. It's like putting a little seed in a supersaturated solution and suddenly you have a big crystal. So you have a seed of like wanting to be angry at something. And then a person walks into the room and you have the perception of them as an enemy. You have the feeling of displeasure. You have a tightening in the body. You have a negative state of darkened consciousness all up coming in one big clumped ball of yarn. And that's a Sankara. It uses, it, it, marshals every other conde in service of it. Um, and the issue, I think Ajahn Suchito, in, you know, they're translated as volitional formations. Ajahn Sona translates them as decisions and emotions. I like Ajahn Suchito's translations as programs. So it's these programs you run, because after a while, you don't actually have to have much of a impetus for that perception of your enemy to initiate all those things in you. I mean, it's what trauma is all about, is you just see something that anyone else wouldn't even notice, but it initiates a program which gathers every conda in service of it. And our personality is similar. It's just made up of all these programs, like I'm an extrovert, I'm an introvert, I have a sense of self-respect. Um, and you know, this can be very negative ones and they can be positive. And you're right to question the overly simplistic conception that this path is just of letting go of the ego, because it's not. Um, Long Ta Mahabua, which is a famous teacher, has said that the Buddhist path we usually divide into sila, morality, samadhi, which is concentration, and panya, or wisdom. 
And uh, Ajahn Mahabhu has said that when you think in terms of morality and concentration, you think in terms of self. Because you're building an ego. You're, you're building a sense of like, I'm someone that never lies. I never kill. I will never hurt someone intentionally. You're building a sense of, you know, being able to direct your programs of your mind states very skillfully and, you know, say an anger, anger arises, you can steer yourself right into loving kindness because you're skilled at it. So, sila and samadhi, morality and concentration are all about building powerful ego and emotional intelligence um, in a way that I think Western psychology barely can touch, if at all. Um, when you think in terms of w wisdom, panya, that's when Ajahn Mahabhuya says you think in terms of not self. So that's when you see all these things I've cultivated, they're transitory, they change, and they're passing. Um, you know, and then when you walk into an environment, say, where someone thinks you did something wrong and you didn't, you know, they don't think you're a generous person. And instead of getting enraged at that fact, you can just be like, yeah, it's the world. And, and also it lets you have a, a sort of sense of gratitude, like every good quality we've we've gained, we can attribute it to someone who taught it to us, you know? It's a beautiful way of thinking. Um, so to have a not-self in that sense is, is good. And then, because these are all changeable formations and they can shift. So the wisdom is seeing through all that. And one issue with, um, say, psychedelic experience or something is people see their whole ego structures fade in one flash of insight. They see that this world and the usual goals of middle-class existence held up for us are, are not worthy of a life completely. Not that you can't live a middle-class existence with a focus on awakening and have a worthy life, just that you know, a minivan and a four-person family, is, you know, I think most of us have aspirations greater than that at some deep level. Um, so, it's difficult because someone maybe has a really powerful, and this is partly where depression comes from, is you see through all the veil, but you haven't cultivated the brightness of spirit and mind and self-respect to hold you in, instead when all that falls away. Because even as these, as sila and samadhi are growing in brightness, the veil you're seeing through more and more with wisdom. And you see that really clearly play out in the enlightened masters like Ajahn Chah. Like, they can take up any of those programs, those ego structures, with unbelievable agility. Like, Ajahn Chah will be admonishing one monk one moment, and then laughing with a bunch of sort of overly uptight monks the next, and then receiving a bunch of lay people who've just lost someone and counseling them. And he could just switch like on a dime completely to what's skillful and so you hold but you hold lightly and then Ajahn Mahabhuya says that so when you when you cultivate sila and samadhi you think in terms of self when you cultivate panya you think in terms of not self and nibbana is beyond both self and not self so yeah We have a question here from the live stream from Raquel Riley. She asks, is Brahma referring to the same entity in the Hindu tradition? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so is Brahma referring to the same entity as the Hindu tradition? So it's a little difficult to parse out because Buddhism was kind of a flash, the Buddha dropped a flash of insight into the religious milieu of ancient India that is difficult to fathom its ripples. Um, and more and more they're tracing those ripples all the way to the Mediterranean. Um, they've established pretty strong ties between, um, you know, the Desert Fathers and the Buddhist uh, texts, saying that even the Christian monastic tradition probably originated in some part from the Buddhist monastic tradition. Up until the 1800s, there was a saint, a uh, church in Italy dedicated to Saint Josephat, 
which was a Christian um, translation of the word bodhisat, like bodhisattva, bodhisattva. And the Desert Fathers would always speak about St. Yosafat, how he suffered for his um, faith, but really they were just the Jataka tales, which had been translated. And that was in second century. So the ripples spread even that far. What's difficult is that Hinduism shifted a lot to accommodate the understandings that Buddhism brought. So the sayings of Upanjali and, or Patanjali, and a lot of the later conceptions of Brahma as a neuter noun, which is sort of a singularity that they speak of, um, may have been flavored a lot by the Buddhist concept of the unconditioned. And it's difficult to parse out like how much of that was before and how much came after. Um, but so the conception of, of Hinduism now current where Brahma is referring to a sort of unconditioned and inarticulatable state, it'd be hard to say how that could be clearly delineated from our conception of Nibbana, um, just as any sort of ultimate pinnacle of language becomes hard to talk about. Um, in the Buddha's time, Brahma, according to the Hindus, was very clearly different than Nibbana. Um, and even in Hindu thought at the time, it seems it did refer to a very high deity that was considered all pervasive and the creator. And the Buddha was pointing to the fact that even that consciousness was conditioned. Um, and, and actually, there's a lot of correspondence with Brahma and the Christian gods. Uh, some of the Brahmas are pictured as having a retinue of angels and such. And um, yeah, the Buddha said that all these were just conditioned states of consciousness. You were saying.